Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the fourth Sunday of Easter on April 30th, 2023. The first reading is Acts 2, 42 through 47. The Psalm is 23. The second reading is 1 Peter 2, 19 through 25. And the gospel reading from John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. I hear it's Good Shepherd Sunday. Happy Good Shepherd Sunday. Feels like this comes every year. It I've, does. I've, I've, I've heard this before. Yeah. Always the fourth Sunday of Easter, and it's always the selection of from John 10. So 10, 1 through 10. Always Psalm 23, right? Psalm 23. Always Psalm 23. We so should just, um, we should just read Psalm 23 every Sunday. It would make life a lot easier. Sure, it certainly would for us, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the liturgists would get all mad. The choir directors would get upset, but. Yes, yes. So, yes, John 10 is always the gospel for Good Shepherd Sunday, year A, John 10, 1 through 10, year B, John 10, 11 to 18, even though the lection actually ends at John 21. John 10, 21, and then John 10, 22 to 30, which has nothing to do with John 10, 1 through 21, but it has sheep in it. Therefore, ergo, it is used for good. You have strong opinions about this. Well, here's my strong opinion, yeah. which which many people already know, but it it I I'm on a mission to uh to re re-engage chapter 10 with chapter nine. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, that was uh, that was what I did with my dissertation. But uh, nobody should buy that book, by the way. Don't buy that book. Uh, but John 10, 1 to 10, the thing is, is that, of course, 9, 1 through 10, 21 is all one unit. And you really miss the meaning and the significance of this image field of Jesus being the gate and the door and the, or the gate, the door and the shepherd without connecting it back to the healing of the man born blind. And so this is, this is what now is promised for this man. Uh, and we just had it, you know, a few weeks ago. So you can go back to that and say, and, and, or maybe you talked about it when you did John nine, but this is the this is the promise for this man and and it, the gatekeeper opens a gate for him and the sheep hear his voice that's exactly what the blind man did he heard jesus voice say go wash in the pool of siloam and so this and then i really do like adding john 19 10 19 through 21 because the question there is trying to figure out who Jesus is. And then they think he's possessed by some demons. And then the question is, why listen to him? Well, why listen to him? Look what happened with the man born blind. Look what happened with the man ill for 38 years. Look what happened in all the way back in John 2, where the, the steward follows the direction of, of Jesus and you end up having an abundance of wine. So you listen, that listening ends up being life and having it abundantly and that is then true for so that it's that capacity that invitation to listen to the voice of the shepherd that then leads to provision protection life abundant that in and of itself is a critical homiletical theme here in in john 10 and and uh and, and then especially for the blind man, this is not this is not Jesus like telling a story hypothetically or like, oh, I think I'll talk about shepherds and gates now. It's it's <laughs> I just did this with the blind with the man born blind. He is now a sheep of my own fold. Uh, he heard my voice. He is now one of my sheep and I am his shepherd and I will never, ever let anything happen to him ever again. And so it's it we can't dislodge this from the reality of how, of what happened with the man born blind. Otherwise it just becomes sort of theoretical and, 
you know, a metaphor, Jesus is my shepherd. And, you know, but what does that really mean? Well, ask the blind man. <laughs> He'll tell you what it meant. Okay. That's my little. I, spiel. I love it. I love it. And you've, con you've convicted me uh, on, on this, Caroline. And, 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 you know, when I talk about Matthew, uh, um, when we talk about um, the Sermon on the Mount, I always go back to um, uh, chapter four. Um, and, and, and you've shown me that that's exactly what's happening here in John. And what, what I love about your weaving together and call, challenging us to do that in our preaching is when we, when we like these little pieces that make, you know, for cute metaphors or, 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 or enchanting stories, and we take them out of how they actually impact people's lives, that's how people doubt. You know, that that's how people say, I can't, I just can't go there. You know, that's great that somebody 2000 years ago, or I don't know, 50 years ago, had some great event happen in their lives. But I haven't seen God show up and show out in my lifetime. I haven't seen God show out and show out in my community. I haven't seen God show up and show out in, anywhere in a zip code that I know. And, and so I think it's the job of the preacher to be able to say, this is why these words matter. And so we let off talking about teasingly reading um, the 23rd Psalm uh, every week. But the question I asked as I'm in this questioning season of Easter, the question I asked of the 23rd Psalm is, why is it powerful? Why does it work so much? And as the commentary says, we don't, we don't know where it is in history. And yet when you do link it to Jesus' words about the shepherd, when you do link it to the reality that their industry then one of those industries with that, that they were sheep herders. And all of a sudden, what that task is matters. Well, how do we preach these wonderful little metaphors so that we show that they are connected to people's lives that matter? And, and, and that's what linking nine and 10, whether we're doing it forward a few weeks ago or whether we're doing it now backwards on the Good Shepherd Sunday. And, and I just want to get on your bandwagon, Caroline, and, and, and argue for all of our listeners to make sure that they don't just tell great stories, but they show, tell stories of a great God showing up and showing out. Yeah. The blind man is basically saying, I am not a metaphor. Yes. Don't and don't, you know, don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'll just say that. I'm not yeah. a metaphor. Yeah. And that, he healed that, the blind, he raised the dead, he, you know, caused the lame to walk. No, those aren't metaphors. Yeah, he right. He healed the blind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's where, you know, and actually this portion, of course, is less about Jesus as the shepherd. Uh, well, you have Jesus as the shepherd, but the good shepherd comes, you know, in chapter, in 11 through 18 or 11 through 21. But, but also uh, I just, I would also challenge the preacher to think, what does it mean to call Jesus as the door or the gate it's door, but it's translated gate here. Cause I guess sheep go to sheep, go through gates rather than doors. And, uh, and we don't have any door hymns, gate hymns. We don't have as many. So that's why it's good shepherd Sunday. So door Sunday, but, but what, what does that mean to call that Jesus is your gate? This is one of the I am statements. I am the gate. I am the door. And for, and and then where that really makes a difference is to go back to the blind man, uh, the man born blind. And it, it is a theme of it is Jesus uh, as the protector. And uh, but but also that that door leads to life, you know, going out to pasture and and uh, and Jesus will be that gate and be that door for his disciples, protecting them in John 18 and the arrest of Jesus, where they've been they're in the garden and he comes out of the garden. He and he leaves his sheep and his disciples safely in the fold. And so now that's the promise for the man born blind. He will be protected now. He will have abundant life now. Jesus will lay down his life for the good shepherd or for the blind man, just as he does all of his disciples and, and protect them from, from the thieves and the bandits and the wolves and the, and the bears, cohort, the bears and the cohort. Yeah. Lions and tigers and bears and the cohort of Roman soldiers that's standing outside the garden. 
And so. also the door image, if we think of uh, the fact that the animals were brought into the homes in the evening. Uh, that's where Jesus was born, right? Not, not, you know, out in a field, but born in the, where the animals were in the home. So that door image, the blind man also, we, we have this tension of his family and Jesus has just restored him to the family of God. And Jesus does that with so many others um, when he heals them and when, when, he, when he talks with them, when he touches them, when he feeds them, what he brings them back to the table of the family. And, and so that there's another door that is, is, is we go out and we come back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Matt, come on. Where's your energy? No, this, I've, I've been enjoying this. I didn't want to wreck it. Um, I, I'm, I love the question about why does Psalm 23 resonate so well with people? I, I love the line that uh, the, the blind man of chapter nine is will not be a metaphor. I, those are really important things. I guess my only... I'll ask a question. It, my, my only thing is, so we could have, whoever decided we should have Good Shepherd Sunday, probably somebody who wanted people to come back to church during Easter or something. I mean, whoever whoever that came from, why have it during Easter? We could have had Good Shepherd Sunday during Epiphany or during the season after mm -hmm. Pentecost. Ooh. So given all this great mm -hmm. uh, homiletical exegesis you two have offered for John 10, what does, how does that matter during the Easter season? Mm -hmm. well, Caroline probably has a better answer for this, but I'm going to go with what Caroline was saying earlier, uh, just in terms of tying together um, the life abundant promise of the resurrection. So um, mm -hmm. if we just read the shepherd as a metaphor or a nice way to get folks back to church and don't tie it to how it impacted someone's life and, and how does the resurrection the fact that Jesus died and was rose, risen again. What tense should I use for that? Anyway, um, how does that impact real people's lives? And then that becomes a question. How does our community gathering once a week impact the community lives of the people in the zip code of our congregation? And I, well, and I think, yeah, and with Psalm 23, and it sounds like we're going there and then we can go, then we can go to Acts, but it makes sense to do Psalm 23. And it's, but, it, but you think about the way in which the Psalm gives, uh, it gives language to that abundance, right? My cup overflows and surely, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me the rest of my days. And how that is again, the promise for the blind man, that goodness and mercy will follow this this man for the rest of his life now. And so how does that Psalm land on, like, as, as you said, joy on him and what, uh, what he, these are the promises for him now. I think also too, with, with the why good shepherd Sunday, I, that life abundantly in John 10, 10, but also to take us back to some of the conversations that we've had this Easter season to take us back to chapter three, that this man, this is, this man has been born again, born anew, born from above. And that that's the resurrection promise that, uh, that how we are born anew uh, and that and and then how do we you know how do we then live that life but i think it's an i think there's a an illusion back to that uh that in john three as well here that that it fits it, but i think it's a great question matt it fits for easter in a lot of different ways and it's an important question to ask just in general how do texts sound differently in different church seasons mm -hmm. right and especially a text like this, which is used often for funerals and uh, but just to call attention to. And I think particularly here, uh, what how would you know, how would the formerly blind man hear these promises now that that there really are for him, that he's really experienced it because he's been made a sheep. So that it's not just, you know, not again, not just a plaque. I'm going to put Psalm 23 on the plaque and hang it on my, you know, in my study or in my living room that, yeah, how do you can get people to uh, experience it in their actual bodies and souls? Be powerful. The, the, the transformation is evident. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
If we jump, if we jump to Acts, um, I've got a song running in my head that I've missed saying. Um, I, I've got a title. No question. I got a title. Hopefully devoted to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We lost her last year, too. Yeah. Isn't that Olivia Newton-John? Yeah, it's Olivia Newton-John from, from Greece. And um, but that just started to ring. And I and I I love the songs in there and I, I loved her voice and uh was sorry for her passing. But uh as as I read this text, it always strikes me in terms of they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And what it was was activity. So because they heard these words, because they understood these stories, because they recognized these promises, whether they're parables or metaphors, et cetera, the result was fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers, which I see as um, not just prayers for me personally, but prayers public for the world that is in need of the abundant life that the Savior has offered to tie it back to our other scriptures. So mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I appreciate this second chapter of Acts because of the activity that is happening um, it, 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 that is a result of that, and particularly the fact that it is the fellowship of all those who gather in the name of Jesus. I love that this podcast is, we're fully embracing our Gen X identity now with Olivia Newton-John in Greece, and we can start <laughs> to do this every week. Um, I'm sure our listeners will Guilty. Really appreciate that. <laughs> we have a lot of shared cultural connections among the three of us, but um, anyway... It's uh, it's a it's a real pleasant coincidence that this passage falls on Good Shepherd Sunday because it's also this is what this is what a secure sheep pen looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what the the kind of sustenance that Psalm twenty three looks like. It's not necessarily God showing up with a picnic basket on your doorstep miraculously, but it's a community where people where people take care of each other, where people actively pursue knowledge about God and opportunities to serve God through serving each other. That, um, this becomes a model, even though people always say, well, this only happens in Acts 2 and Acts 4. There are other places in Acts where people go out of their way to offer costly hospitality to other people. Um, this is part of how the book of Acts imagines what Christian faith will do to you, what happens when you, when you become a follower of the resurrected Christ. And so in that regard, it's how Christ operates as a shepherd within a community. Um, Jesus is not mentioned here. We're told that God, the Lord, adds to the number of those who are being saved. But in terms of how the community functions, this is a this is an offshoot of Pentecost. The the commentary talks about that this week. This is this is as much of the Pentecost story as is the the tongues of fire, and the Joel quotation and Peter's sermon and all the baptisms. It's the community that the Spirit creates, and so that's fine, right? Easter, you can't talk about Easter without talking about Pentecost, or you shouldn't talk about Easter without acknowledging that Pentecost is, you can't dissociate those, those, those events in the event of Jesus. And so, you know, to start talking about what does that look like? Well, how do we bear witness to this Christ, to the shepherd today? We do it partly in our, how we take care of ourselves. I, I worry about churches that are so interested in in reaching out and finding new ways to be attractive to the community that they haven't first taken care of their own internal dynamics. And you, if you invite people into a toxic community, they see uh, they're not going to want to come back. Um, and not just even a toxic one, but one where people don't display this kind of self giving love, which is hard. Yeah, yeah. It's easier when, to hire a consultant when a visitor can walk into a church and walk through crowds of people and not be greeted once, that visitor is not likely to return again. Yeah. <laughs> not that I've ever had that happen to me. Mm. Yes, <laughs> but, yeah. I have a great story about that, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> that's for another podcast. The, the, the other thing to note, and I'm going to get a little nerdy on us uh, right now, but uh, is just to remember that um, the first writings were the epistles. The letters were written first. And, and so when you think of 
what it is that is being asked for, and particularly when we talk about Galatians and Corinthians, what is being asked for in the community where uh, the different groups are called together in the name of Jesus. And I made reference to this uh, a week or so ago. Um, but also um, this Acts picture is exactly what was being expected in those epistles. And, and, and so what happened here that is described was prescribed in light of what happened even before those stories were written is what I'm trying to, trying to get at. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. And I, I'll just, I, I think we've uh, shared essentially what I would say about the Acts passage, but the, these are the results of the resurrection, right? This is what resurrection looks like, resurrected resurrection life looks like. And we've been talking about that throughout the Easter season is that that resurrection impinges on our behavior and who we are and who we are as a community. And, and, uh, and I think that's also particularly important for the, the man born blind in that that he's brought into a community and, and because he was thrown out of his community in 934 and God find Jesus finds him and brings him into his fold, his community. But it's not, it's not just, no, it's not just between him and Jesus. It is being brought into this life-giving, uh, this life-giving community. Uh, and, and then so Acts gives us a picture of what that looks like. And uh, and so I think that's an important connection. And uh, I might go to First Peter. Is that is that good? Uh, and where I would use the First Peter text uh, on this Sunday is verse 25. Uh, For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. I mean, obvious connection, but... Uh, but uh, that that particularly in connection with the man born blind that no he didn't go astray but he was <laughs> he was astray is that a word I don't know it is now oh okay, it is now and and Jesus and Jesus finds him and brings him into the fold and and the guard and you know the term guardian is a lovely way to think about another way to language Jesus as the gate or Jesus as the door, the guardian taking taking care of taking care of his sheep. So that's where I would gives you some more language for that. Can we read only verse 25? Yes. <laughs> no. That's I'm just saying that's how I would that's you know, you would go with it. I would that's how I would put Peter into all, first Peter into all this. I'm not sure what I would do with the rest of it, but yeah, I totally I agree. The, I'd rather just do 25. And I do the, I do the same thing. I, I did focus on what is unjust suffering, but in light of the man born blind, I mean, um, you know, remember that story begins off. Well, who messed up that he got to be blind? You know, this is somebody's fault. It, you know, and, and Jesus says, well, actually not. Yeah, and, uh, and, and so this, this whole like this whole content of what is unjust suffering, um, and and in in when I when I highlighted it, what I was thinking is not not how am I experiencing suffering unjustly, but being challenged to ask God, where am I the cause of someone else's suffering unjustly? Because that's what that scene is. You know, the right question we've been taught, somebody must have done. So tell us, who do we blame for this? And that question in and of itself was unjust. Yeah, the, I, I totally am on board with what you both are doing with the passage of trying to find <laughs> ways to, to work with it. Um, I, what our listeners may or may not know is that the you here starting in verse 19 and, is, and onward is introduced in verse 18. These are enslaved people. It's, and so the, that's who the author is addressing here and, and saying basically accept the authority of your, of your masters, of your Lords, whether they're kind to you or whether they're cruel to you, because that's what Jesus did. Yeah. You know, so there's, can't pack this in a single sermon, but that's, it's one of the reasons why this is, I think a really difficult passage, given that we have no idea who the author kind of is is this an author who's really even truly sympathetic to that experience or is this an author saying can't be that bad come on 
yeah. suck it up like Jesus did. We, and we just, we'll never know the answer to that entirely, but it's, it's a way in which I think a passage like this, whatever hits historical context in our own context, how we also make sure we don't um, fetishize or glamorize suffering mm -hmm. as somehow redemptive in and of itself or good in and of itself, which is the message I know a lot of people hear sometimes um, in churches, um, which then of course has the, the ironic, tragically ironic twist of of making 25 kind of verse 25 the opposite of what it's intended to be right it's it's now all of a sudden god is the one who um isn't going to keep you safe and can't be trusted to do that and so i really appreciate matt um whenever we are, are, are running across these texts you're calling us uh to account to attentiveness to reading it in that context um and i i, I want to add the one of the things that uh, I see a lot in our culture is people who want to use this to talk about their own suffering um, and people who um, feel like they are losing power um, and and their response to whatever they feel is this loss is violence. It is to act against those uh it is to cancel it is and i know maybe we shouldn't let me say this today but i'm i'm uh, this is where that reading that you say matt frustrates me because um when i look at what my ancestors have experienced and what they have dealt with and out of a christian accountability they did not take action against their perpetrators. That becomes a more hopeful word for those who claim to be Christian and who want to carry a gun, who claim to be Christian and want to storm the steps of a Capitol, who claim to be Christian and want to kidnap a governor, who claim to be Christian and want to cancel people. I just wonder what it would look like if everything that we've talked about these last couple of weeks and this, this week in particular about extending the invitation for people to, in the presence of their enemies, to let God uh, uh, give them their sustenance, for let, to let the risen Christ offer them abundant life and not be seduced by the, per, uh, the perishable gold and, and silver of this world. And in that particular sense, I read First Peter as a warning for everybody who wants to say that I'm just going to go after my enemies. It's like, no. Nah. And I got in trouble for saying this at my mother's funeral, um, but I, I, I leave my enemies to God because I'm scareder for you of what God can do to you than what I can think of doing for you. Maybe that's not a good place for us to end. No, we don't have to end. Just, just we got to we got People can just stop the podcast if they don't like it. Um, okay. <laughs> no, I appreciate Help what you're saying. Well, I think what we're, I think what this conversation might be illustrating in some way is the challenge then of a preacher to allow those variety of perspectives, right? The problem, the, the one of the challenges of preaching is its monologue, but coming from somebody who's trying to speak to and behalf of a, a wider community. And the other challenge is that so many of our churches are so homogeneous that it's, it's it it's sometimes it's easy to know what what the perspective is that will get you handshakes and slaps on the back afterwards and but it's to bring and I, I think back to what Caroline said earlier about John nine that the the man born blind there will not be made a, into a into a metaphor that and so this is where it's tough and, and you two are the preaching experts but how does a sermon how does a preacher embody a variety of perspectives like that speaking about an experience that's not their own wanting to stand up for justice i mean all of these things are very difficult to do in 60 minutes let alone in, in 12 to 20 minutes in a, in a sermon but i don't know if we're getting anywhere on this but it's um don't if you're if your response to first peter 2 is too simple or you you look at it and you think oh i know how to handle this then you probably haven't sat with it long enough might be one of the things that we're saying but or if what you're wanting to do is to make suffering that metaphor that is good, as you said, where we can't trust God, then you need to sit with the text longer because the, the text is consistent in being able to say that God is good and God provides our needs and get, that, that we are given an abundant life 
and that those who have been lost have been found and that those who have been ostracized are brought home. Uh, and even in the presence of their enemies, they will be given abundant. And if, if, if you haven't wrestled as, as I did when I first looked at the text, how am I the perpetrator of injustice? Rather than let me just complain about how I've been unjustly um, treated unjustly. Yeah. Maybe the church needs to ask, how are we the perpetrators? Mm -hmm. oh, of course. Yeah. Thank you.